Okay, hello. Hi, hello. How are you? Are you Good, and you? Yes, I can Yes, I cannot hear you very well, but uh, we can start whenever. Sorry. That's great. Now I can hear you. Yes, perfect. Okay, I would like to give a short introduction about you and the office, so we will start immediately, okay? With pleasure. Great being with you. Uh, okay. Okay, Kalorat is the um, founder of International and Design Innovation Office Kalorat Associate and Director of Sensible Lab at uh, MIT. And Rati is a leading voice in the debate on new technologies impact on the life. As you know, his works uh, have been in including the Venice Biennale, New York's um, Museum of Modern Science Museum, Barcelona's Design Museum, and he was the chief curator of 2019 and the of architecture. Uh, three of his projects, the Digital Water Pavilion, the Copenhagen Wheel, and Scribit, were selected by Time in, as best innovation invention of the year. He has been included in Wired magazine, Artless, The People Will Change the World. He is uh, currently serving as co chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council and on Cities and Organization. One of the studio's latest projects includes Cura, a movable intensive care unit to be used for the treatment uh, of cash. First prototype was built in Milan, is that correct? Yes. Yes, perfect. And his other projects include uh, the extension of Brasilia's historical master plan with high tech innovation district and a floating garden that brings a new uh, alternate mobility system to the waterfront. Uh, so I would like to jump my first question, but I would like to ask, how are you? How do you feel? How is your mood in the suppressed times? No, I think everything, everything is very good, by the way, great, <clears throat> great to be live with you. Uh, sorry, I was, on the, I was on the beach, actually I've been trying myself to do some kind of uh, smart working in a different way. Um, I wrote an article about it if somebody's interested, an op-ed was in Inc. magazine a couple of weeks ago. But I think the fact that we actually, one of the consequences of what's happening is uh, how we can actually travel in a slower way and spend more time in, uh, in different places. So anyway, while I was traveling across Europe, I did my lockdown in the US and then came to Europe over the summer, slowly from one place to another one. I broke my hand and that's why you see me like this, but uh, everything else is uh, very good and great to be with all of you. Oh, thank you. Okay, it's good to see you here. Uh, I got a, I see a message of somebody who's saying that the, the voice is breaking up. I don't know if it is my voice or um, your voice. I don't know, but I can hear you well. Well, if you can, okay. Okay. I was seeing a message in uh, among the comments. Anyway. Okay. Okay. So I would like to start with um, the role of technology. I mean, the role of technology has never been so important in this, uh, you know, our lives nowadays. It's not a communication tool anymore. It's a life-saving issue nowadays. Is that right? Maybe there will be no paperwork in our uh, life at a certain time, but considering your approach and the projects that you do at MIT and in your studio, uh, with all their data-driven work uh, with code softwares and real-time tools. So positively, I want to think you were never using a paper in your normal workflow. But I would like to ask again how this uh, pandemic changed anything in your workflow apart from simply work planning and simply in-person meetings, I mean, in, in a radical manner? Well, <clears throat> look, I think the pandemic has changed many things and in particular has actually accelerated many changes that were already happening. And uh, I believe, personally believe that now, well, now it's an intermediate time, so we need to live with the virus. But if you look down the line in six, 12 months or longer, then you know, life will go back to, we will not need social distancing anymore, but some of these changes we're experiencing now will stay. For instance, I think we all enjoy the flexibility we have with uh, smart working. Every company on the planet, most companies on the planet have experienced some degree of it. And, uh, and so I think that is something that most likely is going to stay. The consequences of that are going to be quite interesting on the city. 
For instance, in Paris right now, people are doing what they call two plus three or three plus two, you know, two or three days per week of smart working. Well, if that is going to stay, potentially we can actually cut down and office, reduce office space by, I don't know, 40, 60% if it is proportional, maybe less, but even just a 30% reduction in office space in our cities would mean a huge change. And that change also will have a lot of impact on the architecture community. I think actually we'll need, uh, I, my impression is that, you know, there will be a pause in development of large office buildings over the next uh, few months and uh, perhaps years, we'll see. But so somehow, you know, this is just to say that some of these changes will be, we revert back to what we had before, you know, we'll go back to hugging and all of that, I'm pretty sure. But uh, some other changes are kind of an acceleration of the process that was happening anyway, and those will stay with us following the pandemic. And so I see something very interesting in cities, also a bit concerning for architects and designers and builders, but certainly very interesting in terms of uh, changes in our cities and, uh, and innovation. Uh, okay, yeah, it's uh, still on the speculation level, but we are experiencing all of them, you know. Uh, so, well, it's still, it's still on the speculation level, but I, I'm, you know, let, let me say a couple of things, you know, by the way, uh, you might have heard about Pinterest uh, cancelling a big lease in San Francisco, uh, Twitter and Facebook saying that, you know, in the future people might not go to the office at all, uh, you know, might leave, might, might work from home forever. I don't think that's going to be the case. I still think we need physical space. Physical space is very important for human connections, for social network, for, 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 for the strengths of our social networks, um, for the in inevitability of meeting people who we don't meet if you just schedule Zoom call after Zoom call. So somehow there's a strength and the importance in, in physical space. So I don't think this is the end of it, but I think we'll certainly see some kind of restructuring. And that's going to be interesting. Yeah, I, that leads me another question. Since everybody is experiencing remote work digitally now and considering that it's quite working under the current conditions, everybody does that, you know, can work remotely. But perhaps that brought us to a more economic model because as you, uh, you know, explained, it shows you don't need to rent a space to come together anymore uh, because you can check your workflow and uh, your time, your manage everything uh, from computer to computer. Do you think that will physical spaces still be needed? If they will be needed, how these spaces be managed from design point of view? Because if you are talking about, uh, you know, for this time, if you want to provide physical distance, you need to design larger spaces. Designing larger spaces mean you need to rethink the land properties or land issues. So it's like a chain of all parameters going to some infrastructural issues. So do you think that will it, it be reconsidered from bottom to top with all aspects from now? No, let's get let's start from the first question you had is on do we still need physical space? I think we still need physical space. As I was saying before, physical space is very important. It's very important for developing a culture for an organization. Is very important for you know the strength of our social network, something which is called weak ties. Weak ties is a famous paper by Mark Granovetter, a sociologist from Stanford, a paper that's now probably almost 50 years old. In that paper, you know, called the strength of weak ties, it says that basically weak ties, uh, weak ties are people we know, but they're not part of our social circle. So the people we know they connect us to another social circle are very important. Uh, for the strength of our uh, social networks and for the flow of information. So weak ties tend to generate in physical space. They tend to weaken if we just uh, connect digitally. So, so anyway, that, those are some of the reasons, culture, weak ties, you know, the pleasure, the sheer pleasure to being with each other that make me think that physical space is certainly going to be central tomorrow. But yes, as you say, you know, it might be different. Our apartment might be a bit bigger. Our offices might need, bit, might need to be a bit smaller. So we might need quite a lot of rethinking. And you know, and the people, the developers who are investing in the wrong product, the architects who are not anticipating these kind of changes tomorrow might be in a difficult position. Yeah, that's true. So going to back your project, Scura, 
because you were one of the architects responding to the current situation as urgent as possible. You designed a prototype and it's an open source in intensive care unit can be shipped to any part of the world. You use the term autonomous in design. And uh, please tell us what does autonomous mean for the Cura? What is the difference between a common intensive care room at the hospitals and the Cura? And what stage is the Cura now? Is still being developed and shipped to other places? Can you update? Yeah, first of all, let me tell you a couple of words about Cura. Now, it was at the beginning of the pandemic and we were asking ourselves, what can we do to help in the crisis? And certainly something that we needed six months ago, but we still need today across the planet is more intensive care units. And so we started thinking about how can we design more intensive care units? How can we make them very flexible so they can move from one place to another place? The problem, for instance, if you look at the intensive care units, the ones that we had installed in New York, for instance, is that, you know, there was a lot of effort to install a temporary hospital with intensive care units. And then uh, after the peak, that had to be dismantled. And you know, it was very costly to do it, to dismantle, and then even to move it somewhere else was very difficult, lengthy, costly, also could expose people, construction workers to the virus. So somehow, you know, that's not the best way. If you need something that can be easily deployed and move from one place to another one. So we ended up developing a system based on containers and uh, the idea is you fabricate in a factory, you build it and you can uh, install it, deploy it very quickly, but also move it from one place to another place. Now that is about the content, but the most interesting things was really then we ask ourselves, how can we replicate it? And now, um, if you do it in a traditional way, times are very long. You know, you need to put together a team, people sign NDAs and so on. So that's why, as you mentioned, we did an open source, we took an open source approach with the idea that everybody could uh, help develop the design and use the design, of course. And so we did a matter of a few days, we had uh, hundreds of people involved, now I think it's over a thousand, and we got many companies who took the drawings and started fabricating. We know there's units have been fabricated in the UAE, in Qatar, in uh, Greece, uh, in the UK, in Italy, uh, in Canada, in the US. So I think, you know, in many countries, people started using this to fabricate uh, curapods. And that for me was a very important lesson because, you know, the virus is actually code. It's genetic code, which is attacking us. It replicates and attacks us. So the best thing we can do is do a design, which is code the code of design that we can replicate in open source and fight back. Somehow open source it has a big advantage that everything can be faster and parallelized. Different teams can start doing the same thing and learn from each other. While the traditional way we do things, we come up with an idea and we have a linear process, which is much lengthier and much more difficult to, to scale up. So can you a little bit describe the interior of the, the unit? I mean, what will patients see, I mean, in the unit? Yeah, well, the unit is, uh, is very simple. I think that for anybody interested, um, you find a lot of images online of the first unit we built um, uh, in Europe, and then some of the others are being fabricated. But it's basically a container. In the container, you got two beds for intensive care. And so everything is fabricated, is done in a factory. So you can very easily deploy it. It will take you just half an hour to deploy two ICUs, which is something that's unheard of, even if you think about uh, uh, camp hospitals. And then, uh, you know, very easily, if you need to move it to another place, you can just take a container and move it around. Yeah, okay, perfect. When we come to, uh, I would like to jump another issue. When we come to the mobility issue during the pandemic, you know, maybe people still don't travel to anywhere because the virus still spreads out um, in the world. But <laughs> certain building typologies uh, that we can see the speed of mobility, like hospitals, airports, stations, which are uh, quite important because millions of people just uh, passing through in a day uh, in these spaces. And in these typologies, there are also some limbo spaces where even they are not taken in, into consideration in normal design process, such as waiting rooms and entry halls and ticket booths at the stations. 
And we start to think on every surface and every material we touch at the airports because it's not just a waiting room anymore because we spend hours there. And uh, at the hospitals, we have seen many patients are just waiting in the entry halls of, of the hospitals, uh, just waiting to be uh, cured, which we automatically re-questions these uh, limbo spaces. So do you think that will these limbo spaces become more impo important in terms of quality and, and space quality, where there'll be more auto autonomous materials, and how will airports or hospitals look like post COVID 19? Yeah, look, I, I think that <clears throat> I need to distinguish two phases. There's a phase now which is living with the virus. We need to share our cities, our apartments with the, with the virus, with the threat of the virus. We need to social distance. So, this is an intermediate phase, and here, yes, those spaces are very important because they allow us to reprogram something, you know, a hospital, the lobby of a hospital, we can reprogram it very quickly. Um, but I think if you look at the long term, um, I really believe that a few years from now, this will be something that will not scare us more than thinking about this, the Spanish flu of 100 years ago. So at that point, we'll go back to being close to each other, to crowd places, to clubs that are crowded, to you know, museums and theaters in a way that we, we used to do. So, so I think you know, in this case, this is not one of the social distancing, I don't think is going to stay with us. I think you know, we, cities have lived through so many epidemics and pandemics, sometimes with even more dire consequences than the ones we are seen now. Think about Venice in the 14th century losing 60%, 6 zero of its population because of the Black Death. I think we've always gone back to the city and you know because it's the power, the magnetic power of the city that brings us together. So I'm pretty sure that this is going to come back. Um, one lesson thought that we might uh, keep is what you were saying about how we've been reprogramming spaces in hospital stations and so on because of COVID. Well, the ability to reprogram is very important. It's a way to transform our cities. So that ability to change the software without changing the hardware that we've seen all over the world, you know, new bicycle lanes that popping up very quickly, uh, new reprogramming of the city, of the road, of the lobby and so on, that might stay with us and it will be very good because it can help have a more flexible interface between uh, uh, the city and ourselves. Yeah, that's true. So we you create a structure of complex networks, you know, prescribed by data. We see these applications in your project starting from large scale to small scale. But when we come to machine learning, sensory tools and automated robots, autonomous vehicles in urban design, I uh, want to focus on the relationship between client and architect. Uh, how far ahead or behind are the real estate industry clients and stakeholders in implementing this but up i mean how how they are conscious and how they are helping to architects in, in general manner yeah. yeah no i if i understand correctly your question the, the the real estate industry is not very advanced and honestly you know if you think about the building industry um, in particular is uh, in many cases is still building until a few years ago was still building buildings in a similar way to how we were building like a hundred or two hundred years ago and uh, I remember actually a report a few just recently maybe five years ago by one of the big consulting firms that was looking at the degree of digitization of different industries and I remember that building was at the bottom together with fishing and hunting um, now things are starting to change because you know everybody's seen a big opportunity in bringing digitization to building, to development, and also you know what you're saying about autonomous driving is changing the city. So somehow, it's becoming a very it now it's becoming more and more important. I remember there's a big fair about uh, about development, one of the largest on the planet. It's in uh, France, in uh, Cannes. Uh, it's called MIPIM. It's every February. And um, I remember five years ago, the innovation part was a small pavilion outside of the main Congress center. But then since then, little by little, last year, it ended up being at the core of the Congress center because innovation became so central to, to the whole discussion.
So somehow uh, I think things are changing and I think developers, um, builders and so on understand more and more that technology can be a game changer in their space. And I think architects should really jump now because uh, I, somehow I think that, that IT for architects today is the same that uh, um, engineering was for Le Corbusier. You know, when Le Corbusier changes or helps to change the paradigm of modern architecture 100 years ago, it's because of a lot of new engineering disciplines entering architecture. Um, and I think there's something similar today, how actually IT and artificial intelligence can enter the physical space, can enter the space of, uh, of the city and uh, change the way we design. Yeah, we will live with the technology, we, will see, we can see it. When we come back to the issue of data control, if we talk about the technology, the management of a plenty of information and directly, I mean, the ethics issue in machine learning, which is still speculative, I guess. I, if you think for a moment that we live in a completely autonomous world, so how about the management of data? Who will decide the assignment of the right information to the right person and, and the right place? So where is the boundary of private mode of mobility and the public modes of autonomous transportation? So is there a research or work about the ethics of machine learning, I should say? Yeah, I think the questions you're raising are very important one. There's many issues of ethics. There's the first issue of ethics about, you know, who controls the data. I think today we should all be concerned about the fact that our private data is being stored and controlled by big companies or big states. And, uh, and we know very little about them, you know, all of our private data that's collected on our, on our smartphones. But that's kind of perhaps a different conversation. It's very important. We should all be concerned about it. But it's perhaps a different conversation. I think the other thing that comes to mind when, I, when, when I'm hearing you is about uh, the fact that uh, when you've got artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence needs to make decisions. A car with artificial intelligence, an autonomous car, needs to decide. And sometimes those decisions can be tough. Uh, there's a very well-known problem called the trolley problem um, that I think many of you probably have heard about. Is about uh, it's a moral dilemma about how you behave in, under certain conditions. And that's a dilemma that the car, the autonomous car, might face. You know, it might be the case that the car is driving an, a longer road and has the option either of, you know, running down two people on the side of the street or maybe bumping into a wall where it will kill the one passenger. And what should the car do? Uh, you know, that's a typical trolley problem, uh, which, which is a moral problem. Now, uh, how do we do it? It's, um, it's not very clear. You know, ethics is not something that usually solved with Boolean logic. Ethics is something quite more complex. You know, if ethics were so simple as black and white, we wouldn't have judges and tribunals and courts, you know, deliberating for a long time about different cases. And that's because, you know, it's, it, it's about human decision making usually and how you look at all the all the, the the different conditions that you got around yourself so so somehow you know uh, it's not going to be easy to demand to artificial intelligence to make decisions such as these ones but that will have to happen soon especially as you say we sell driving cars yeah okay that leads me to another question about automated robots in the construction industry in built environment and cobots have also been used more than 10 years uh, in the market, but how would you compare the pros and cons of the fully automated robots in construction sites? Because there are some speculations uh, on performance of robots and they do not perform very well. They need to be developed still. But I want to reverse my question and want to ask if they are fully automated robots soon, replacing with human race, uh, with doing all the jobs in the construction size through machine learning, calculating um, a maximum possibilities, which means if we can train a robot properly. So what will happen if a robot or cobots will have own skill? Should this be something that scares us for the future? If we are going to work um, with a trained architect robot in the office or... <laughs> Well, um, I think, you know, the, the, the question, the question you're asking is a very, you know, is very important question is the question of singularity, what happens when artificial intelligence overtakes human intelligence, and that includes also the robotic side. 
Now, if you look at the past, over the past thousands of years of human civilization, usually technology would actually provide us, say, with something that was better than us, a physical task. Think about, you know, technology would provide the, the invention of the wheel or something that would actually would, would allow us to do things that we couldn't do physically with our, with our uh, force, with our human power, but we could actually do things with technology. Think about what a tractor does in the countryside. Think about what we can do with a, with a normal car. But the intelligence was never outsourced, really. So it, it basically what we did, we outsourced a lot of the mechanical tasks or the labor intensive tasks, but we kept a lot of intelligence for ourselves. And that's, just, that's when you look at the past 10,000 years of human development, that's what you see in broad strokes, even more than 10,000, say 10,000, because around 10,000 years ago is when cities starts. But you, know, you can look at this before the beginning of, uh, of cities. And, um, and now, you know, what happens when, uh, when artificial intelligence can take over is, uh, is an important question to be debated. Uh, I don't think we have the time today to go in depth, but I wanted to say, given that many of the people here today uh, are people in the domain of design and architecture, uh, I'd like to refer to a great artist, uh, Constant. Constant was one of the situationists. He was uh, active in Europe, in the Netherlands, in France uh, in the 1960s and 70s. And Constant um, was asking this question already. He was saying, you know, what will happen to man when we'll be totally freed from labor? And his vision was very positive, was actually we'll all be playing. Uh, he called it homo ludens, so man at play. Because we'll be freed from uh, any type of labor, then, you know, what will remain to, to humans will be actually the freedom to experience a play. And he was saying also art will disappear because everybody will be an artist in, the, in, his, in his or her daily life. So somehow, you know, that's a positive view. I think we could also look at more dystopian views. Um, it's something to be very, you know, it's a very interesting topic to be debated. Um, but I think, you know, I'd like to, uh, given the, you know, the, 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 this forum and, and, you know, and what we are talking about, architecture and design and art, I think, you know, I think Constance's um, vision is certainly something to, to try to realize, to materialize, and something interesting when we look at what uh, our future with robots and intelligence, artificial intelligence, will be. Okay, so we collected a couple of questions from our audience before. One of our followers asked, what are the most painful stages of design after the team made a consensus on the idea in your studio? Well, I think the most, <clears throat> the most painful stage or the most difficult stage is not necessarily coming up with an idea, is usually killing an idea or a bad idea. You know, today we are, we are exposed to many, many ideas. We can look online, we get a lot of inspiration somehow you know, the problem many times is not necessarily um, the ideation process itself, is being able to tell a good idea from a bad idea. Uh, that's something that Ernest Hemingway, the great writer, once called the bullshit detector. So being able to tell what is good and what is not good, kill a bad idea, and let live a good one. That's the most difficult and sometimes painful thing. Uh, so, uh, and the second question came from other follower, what are the materials used in the floating garden for Switzerland project? Yeah, so um, we, we've been experimenting a lot with floating uh, structures. Actually, the, the Swiss project for Lugano was coming out of something we, show, we had shown at the Tallinn Biennale uh, probably five years before and some experiments we've been doing. So what you want to do, you, you want to have something floating and that can be done usually in two different ways. One is steel. At the base, one is concrete as well, you know, uh, waterproof concrete. And then on the top of that, you, you actually have the whole structure, which is a blend of natural and artificial. So above that on the island, um, the, all the materials uh, will be a blend of natural and artificial. With the idea, what we'd like to do is that everything is really circular, so that everything we use in the making of the island is, uh, is uh, thought from the beginning with a circular it's kind of in a circular way. Uh, okay, so last question. What is uh, always missing point between the designer and the client in the design process? Uh, sorry, could you repeat it? What is the? What is always a missing point um, 
between the designer and the client what what was the hard thing and what is the hard thing you always experience in the design process between the client and the architect um i don't think i don't know if you can generalize but i want to say something related to this which is today an amazing thing is that you know we can start a design without a client and then we can go on kickstarter or other platforms we can just make it public and you know the community will help us help us make it a reality so somehow it's a different way to approach it's not the standard way which is find a client and then do a project but first dream and then find a client so it's actually turning things upside down and i think it's a very exciting opportunity we had today thanks to the network that we didn't have a few a few years ago oh so some offices use this as a strategy so you all you also use this uh, as a strategy in your studio right and is it it's a, it's a way to develop something even without a client and then you know if it is a good idea you might be able to find it maybe with a real client maybe with a distributed client like many people on kickstarter helping you to realize it uh, okay okay i see so thank you carlo you answered everything and this was an amazing discussion uh, thank you thank you very much great thank you very much great being with all of you and uh, to be continued Yes, I hope to see you in anywhere in the world soon. I hope soon. It will happen soon. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.